topic of this lecture is deep learning. My name is Johan Hagelbeck and I'm a senior lecturer at Linnaeus University. The focus will be on image classification, which can be a difficult task. And some of the challenges we have to face are viewpoint variation. An object can be oriented in many ways. Scale variation. Objects can vary in size. Deformation. Some objects can be deformed. Occlusion. Only a part of the object is visible. Illumination conditions. We can have very different lighting conditions on an object. Background clutter, some objects may blend into a clutter background, and intra-class variation. Categories can be very broad, such as a chair. So this is illustrated here, the viewpoint variation, the statue to the upper left is, we look at it from different angles. The illumination conditions, we have very different lighting conditions on the same objects. Scale variation, these two humans vary in scale. Deformation, this cat has a very weird position. Uh, the background clutter, an object is cluttered into a uh, background. Uh, occlusion, we only see a small part of this black cat. And intraclass variation, we have six variants of chairs and they all look very different. And the data set can also be very large with lots and lots of categories. So we have a red category, which are cats, and they all look quite different. The green category are dogs. Uh, the yellow category, mugs. Uh, and we see that a mug can obviously also look very different. Uh, and the blue one is hats, and we have quite many different hats as well. Another problem is that each image requires a lot of input values. Suppose we have an image like this cat of 248 times 400 pixels, and if the image is in color, which images usually are, we have one value for red, one for green, and one for blue, so RGB free color channels. The image is then made up of 248 times 400 times three values which is 287,600 values, which we need to fed into our classifier. So, what are deep learning? Deep learning means any deep neural network with more than one hidden layer. But when we talk about deep learning, we often mean specialized deep networks for certain tasks. And the most well-known specialized deep neural network is the convolutional neural network for image classification. And this is what we shall focus on in this lecture. So the convolutional neural network or CONNETs or CNNs are quite similar to traditional neural networks. They are made up of units that have learnable weights and biases. Each unit performs a dot product of the weights and inputs and possible ends with a non-linearity such as the ReLU function. And the output layer maps inputs to a category and we have a loss function such as softmax. So what are the actual differences? In ComNets we assume that the input is images. It's only images we input to this type of classifier and it allows us to specialize the architecture for images. And this makes the score function more efficient and reduces the number of weights in the network. So in a regular neural network, the input is a vector which is transformed for one or more hidden layer, and each layer is made up of units, and each unit is fully connected to all units in the previous layer. And each unit in a layer is independent of the other units in the same layer. And the last output layer maps inputs to categories. And it turns out the regular neural networks don't scale well to images. The Cypher 10 dataset, each image is 32 times 32 pixels in three color channels. A fully connected unit will then have 3072 weights. And since the image recognition task is rather complex, we would also need a lot of units. If we have larger images, for example 200 times 2 pixels, that's very small for an image considering how many pixels we have in cameras today, each unit would need 120,000 weights 
and learning all these weights would take a very long time. In Comnets, we assume that images are three dimensional, width, height, and depth for color channel. We can have monochrome as well, but usually we have colored images. And each layer in the Comnet therefore arranges the units in three dimensions. Each unit is also only connected to a small region in the previous layer, they are not fully connected. And each layer transforms the 3D input volume to a new 3D output volume. So if we compare them, the top is a regular three layer network. We have an input layer, two dimensional layer, we have two hidden layers fully connected and we have an output layer. And in the comnet, on the other hand, we have the input volume, which is the number of pixels in width and height and the number of color channels. And this is transformed to new 3D volumes in the hidden layers and an output volume. So a comnet is a sequence of layers where each layer transforms one 3D volume to another 3D volume through some function. And there are three main types of layers to use. The convolutional layer, the pooling layer, or the fully connected layer, which is identical to regular neural networks. And the sequence of these layers form a convnet architecture. The convolutional layer or conv layer is the core block of comnets. It consists of a set of learnable filters. And each filter is small along width and height, but it extends through the full depth of the volume. A typical filter in the first comnet layer can, for example, have filters of 5 times 5 pixels times 3 color channels. During the forward pass, each filter is slides across the width and height of the input volume. And dot products are computed between each filter and the input volume at any position. As the filter slides over width and height of input volume, a two-dimensional activation map is produced for each filter. It gives a response for the current filter at every spatial position in the input volume. And the network will learn filters that activate when we see some interest in visual features, such as an edge, a specific color, or more high-level features in later con layers. The con layer will have set of filters, for example 12, and each filter produces a separate 2D activation map. So if we have 12 filters, we have an output volume of 12 2D activation maps. And the activation maps are stacked along the depth dimension and produces the output volume. Each unit is only connected to a local region of input volume. This is referred to as the receptive field of the unit. For example, if we have Cypher 10 images as inputs, they are 32 times 32 pixels in three color channels. The receptive field is 5 times 5, that's the size of the filter. Each unit will then have 5 times 5 times 3 weights, which equals 75 weights and 1 bias, which is much less than 3072 weights needed for a fully connected unit. So we can visualize it like that. We have an input volume, which is 32 times 32 pixels in three color channels. And we have filters of five times five pixels and, they, and three color channels. We have the same depth as the input volume. And this slides over every pixel in the input volume. And each filter produces a 2D activation map in the output volume. So the output volume has the same width and height for the two pixels and a depth of five in this case since we use five filters. So the first filter produces a 2D activation map at depth one in the output volume. The second filter slides over the input volume and produces an activation map at depth two in the output volume. And the third filter slides over the input volume and produces an activation map at depth 3 in the output volume. The com layer has three settings or hyperparameters as they are usually called the depth, the stride and zero padding. The depth is simply the depth of the output volume 
which corresponds to the number of filters we have. Stride means how we slide each filter over the input volume. In stride 1, the filter is moved one pixel at a time, so it covers all pixels in the input volume. In stride 2, we jump two pixels, covering half of the pixels in the input volume. And in that case, we will have a smaller output volume as well. Zero padding. If we place a filter at the edges of the image, some part of the filter will be out of bounds of the image. So along the borders of the input volume, some pixels in the, in the volume will be outside of the filter. When zero padding is used, we pad the input volume with zeros around the border to avoid out-of-bounds issues for our filters. And the parameter determines the size of the zero padding, and the size shall be half the filter size for the filters to cover all pixels in the input volume. So in the example here, we have a filter that's the bluish pixels, a 5x5 filter. filter. It slides over a volume with zero padding 2. So the filter is positioned at the first pixel in the image, the pixel with a value of 45, and we need a zero padding of 2 for the filter to not be out of bounds of the input volume. The size of output volume is determined by the input volume size, then called W, the receptive field size called F, the stride called S, and the zero padding P. And the size, the number of units of the output vo volume will then be W minus F plus 2P divided by S plus 1. So for example, if we have an input volume of 32 times 32 pixels, Filters are 5 times 5 pixels, we have a stride of 1 and a padding of 0. The output volume is then 28 times 28 pixels, and depth depends on the number of filters we use. The idea here is that each depth fly slice uses the same weight, the weights of the filter, regardless of position in the input volume, so it's not fully connected and the forward pass can then be computed as a convolution of a unit's weights with the input volume. And that's why the layer is called a conv layer. So we see an example here. We have a depth with the three color channels and the values for the three color channels in the input volume. And we slide our filters, that's the filters are three times three pixels in three color channels. And we have two filters, so the output volume is 3 times 3 times 2, using stride 2 and padding 1. So the first filter in the first color channel, uh, that's the top red one, uh, we have pairwise, element-wise multiplication between the input volume and the filters. Uh, this is the mathematical term called convolution. So we have 1 multiplied one by 1 plus 2 multiplied by 1 equals 3. Uh, if we do element-wise multiplication, we'll see that the result will be 3. In the second color channel, the result will be 1 multiplied by minus 1 plus 2 multiplied by 1 plus 2 multiplied by 1, which equals 3. And the third color channel, the result will be 2 multiplied by 1 plus 2 multiplied by minus 1 plus 1 multiplied by minus 1, which equals minus 1. And the bias is 1. And if we sum all these values, the result will be 6. And we place the result 6 in the output volume at the correct position, the position uh, where we currently slide our filter. It can be quite interesting to visualize the filters, and here are some examples of the filters learned by Krzyzewski and his colleagues in the ImageNet Challenge. And each filter is 11 times 11 pixels in three color channels, and a total of 96 filters is used. So if we visualize the filters, we see that they learn some features such as edges and, and different colors and color combinations.
the second type of layer is the pooling layer. And pooling layers are inserted between conv layers. And the purpose is to reduce the size of the volumes, which reduces the number of weights needed and also controls overfitting. And the pooling layer acts independently on every depth slice of the input volume. The width and height of each slice is reduced using the max operation. And the most common type of pooling is to use 2 times 2 filters with a stride of 2. This cuts the width and height in half and reduces activations with around 75%. And the max operation takes the max value of 2 times 4, which is 2 times 2, which is 4 pixels. So we can look at it like this. Uh, the output volume and the input volume are the same in depth. And the pooling layer at the depth of 2 in this case, it takes a 32 times 32 pixels and we calculate the max operation and then we cut the width and height of the output volume in half compared to the input volume. And the max operation works like this, so we have a single depth slice, in this case we have 4 times 4 pixels and the first max operation uh, looks at the 4 red values and takes a max value which is 6. The second max operation looks at the 4 green values and the max is 8. The third max operation looks at the yellow values and the max is 3. And the fourth max operation looks at the blue values and the max value is then 4. So we cut the, the width and height in half by using 2 times 2 filters and a stride of 2. And the third type of layer is the fully connected layer and it works as the hidden layers for the output layer in a regular neural network. And the activation is matrix multiplication followed by a bias offset as we learned in, in the lecture about neural networks. We usually or also write really non-linearity as a layer. And it takes each value in the input volume and calculates the real activation of that value. As you remember, the real activation is the max between 0 and x, so it will never have any negative values. And no matrix operations are done in the real layer. So, some common convnet architecture. How can we create some architecture that works for convolutional neural network. They are made up of conv layers, pooling layers, fully connected layers and really non-linearity layers which are sometimes um, they are not shown as separate layers. And the most common convnet architecture is stacking a few conv really layers, follow them with pool layers and when the volume is of small enough size transition to fully connected layers. And the last layer is an output layer, outputting a score for each category where we map the inputs to inputs to a category. So an example architecture is here. We shall classify this image hopefully as a car. So we have a comb layer followed by a real layer, comb layer followed by a real layer, and we have a pooling layer, and then we have two comb real layers, a pooling layer, comb real layers, a pooling layer, and an output fully connected layer, which in this case outputs the image as a car. The ImageNet Challenge is an annual contest for image classification and localization tasks. And the training dataset consists of around 1.2 million images and 1,000 possible categories. So an extremely complex image classification task. And the validation set for this challenge is a random subset of 50,000 images. Images can differ in size, but in average the resolution is 482 times 415 pixels. And the ImageNet is the benchmark for image classification systems. 
and there are several named standardized architectures used in the ImageNet chat and some of them are the LeeNet, the first successful ComNet developed in the 1990s, the AlexNet that won the ImageNet challenge in 2012 by a wide margin, that's the first time uh, the ComNet was used in the ImageNet challenge. ZFNet, an improvement of AlexNet that won the ImageNet challenge uh, the following year. Google Net uh, won 2014 years challenge and the VGG Net ended at second place in 2014 years ImageNet challenge. So let's take a closer look at the VGG Net architecture. It looks like this. So we have an input layer, 224 times 224 pixels. So we modify the size of input image so all images fit into 224 times 224 pixels. And then we have a conv layer followed by Relu uh, with 64 filters, 3 times 3 filters, and followed by a new Comnet and Relu layer also with 64 filters. And then we have a pooling layer that cuts the width and height of the input volume in half. And then we have uh, a conv plus rail layer with 128 filters, two of them followed by a pooling layer. And when we continue this combination of comnet layers and pooling layers until in, in the end we have two fully connected rail layers followed by a softmax output layer with 5,000 possible categories. So we can visualize it like this. So we have the image and we have the first conv layer and then we have the pooling layers and we see that the size of the width and height of the input volumes are shrinked gradually until in the end we have the fully connected softmax layer. So we have a quite deep network, but it's not as wide because we cut the width and height with the pulling layers. In total, VGGNet needs around 93 megabytes of memory per image for the forward pass and around twice that for the backward pass where we learn the weights. In total, the architecture has 138 million parameters, weights and biases. And we need to use the graphical processing units to efficiently train the architecture. Memory can, however, be an issue in many GPUs, and we might need to use more memory efficient architectures. Comnets and other the deep convolutional neural networks, depending on the architecture, of course, but in general, they have high memory and computational requirements. And the most important hardware here is the GPU, since comnets can uh, benefit from highly parallelized operations. Uh, so we need a hardware that is supported by the comnet library we currently use. So TensorFlow, uh, Google TensorFlow, supports many NVIDIA graphics cards, but rarely cards from other brands. As an example, we will look at the MNIST dataset. It's a dataset of handwritten digits, 0 to 9, and each image is 28 times 28 pixels, and we only have one color channel, which is grayscale in this case. And we have a training set of 60,000 images and a test set of 10,000 images, and of course 10 categories, since we have 10 digits. And the ConMet architecture we shall use is the input layer, 28 times 28 times 1, because we only have one color channel and 28 times 28 pixels. This is followed by a ConNet layer with 32 pixels, followed by a ReLU. Uh, so the volume size is 28 times 28 times 32. And the filters are 5 times 5 times 1 in size, only one color channel. And then we have 
a standard 2 times 2 pooling layer with stride of 2, so we cut the width and height in half, so now we have a 14 times 14 times 32 inputs. This is followed by a, conv a new convolutional layer followed by ReLU. Uh, with 64 5 times 5 times 32 filters because the input volume was 32 in depth. Uh, and it's followed by the second pooling layer which cuts the size, the width and height in half. So now we have 7 times 7 times 64 pixels in the volume size. And now we follow it by a fully connected layer with two. 1024 units followed by an output layer with 10 possible categories. And the script for creating and running the ComNet on the MNIST dataset in TensorFlow is available from TensorFlow's webpage. You can just copy paste the script there. And training iterates 20,000 times and each iteration trains on a batch of 50 images. And when I trade and uh, trained with Comnet and evaluated it on my MacBook Pro laptop, it took around 57 minutes. The accuracy in the test set was 99.22%. And compare this to a linear softmax classifier. Training and evaluation using the linear classifier now took around 2 seconds and the accuracy was 91.6%. So Comnets are very very effective, um, very high accuracy, they can learn very well from images but they take a long time to train. And using comnets on more complex image data sets requires expensive server hardware. An interesting library is Keras. It's a high-level API running on top of different deep neural network libraries, for example TensorFlow. And you can download it for Ker from keras.io. And Keras is especially useful since it contains pre-trained ImageNet models, for example VGG16 and VGG19. And training such models is extremely time-consuming, so getting access to a pre-trained model can be very useful. So I downloaded it and tested it, and the first image example was uh, this BMW convertible car, uh, and the label was with 98.09% probability that it was a convertible, 0.63% that it was a sports car. So that's that's a correct classification. It's obviously a convertible car. Maybe it should have a bit higher probability for being a sports car as well, but of course that's is it depends on how we define a sports car. Another very interesting thing is Google Vision API and you can test it from the, the Google vision web page. Here you can upload a picture and you get a classification of that picture. Uh, you can also connect via the API and upload pictures but I haven't tried it yet. Uh, and I uploaded this picture of a cat and uh, with 99% probability it was a cat and a Siamese cat with 95% probability. I don't know much about cats, but I know that this is a Siamese cat. Small to medium sized cats, 93%. Cat-like mammals, 92%, and so on. So, that's obviously a correct classification. This is a cat. I tried another picture now of a plate of sushi. And the dish was 93%, that's correct. Cuisine, 92%. Food, 91%. Can't say much about that. Then was something called Gimbap with 88%. And I didn't know what that was, but I learned that Gimbap is kind of Vietnamese sushi. And sushi with 88% and Japanese cuisine with 85%. So obviously also a correct classification. 
The last thing I tried was upload a picture of myself. And now it turned out that obviously you have uploaded a picture of a human and now instead it looked how, at how I felt at the picture. So we've very very likely that I was happy in the picture and very unlikely that I was had any sorrow, anger or surprised faces. So Google Vision a API has many interesting features that you can play around with. So that was all I had to say about deep learning and comnets. Thanks for listening. Thank you.